You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 174 of the Common Descent Podcast. This episode, we are talking about the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. I've heard of that. Yeah, I I know we've mentioned it before. I can't remember which episode it was that it it came up notably one time. It's come up in the news. Mm -hmm. I think it might have come up in the Reefs episode. That's what it was. That might have been the one. That's what it was. This is a very, very heavily studied event that takes place, as the name suggests, heavily in the Mesozoic. When the marine communities, mainly in shallow water areas, was revolutionized Mm -hmm. and basically set up to be what we recognize it as today. Yeah, this is a recurring theme on the podcast, especially when we do sort of the big picture throughout geologic time discussions. Like the last episode, Herbivory had some of this in it. There are times throughout Earth history and throughout the evolution of life on Earth where something happens that allows for ecosystems as we know it. Yes, exactly. Where some big chunk of what we find familiar was established. Yes. This is one of the biggest ones for marine communities, at least shallow water marine communities. This is when the ecosystems that we think of as being that coastal and you know tidal area uh, habitats really took shape. So if you were worried that our summer ocean trend had ended, it didn't. I'm not ready to get out of the water. We're back in the sea. Yeah. Yar. This is a extremely complex topic. Uh, We will be doing a brief overview of the general trends that have been noticed that brought attention to this event having happened. What are some of the main things that we saw change and show up during this time? How have we been able to notice that? You know, how do we study and track these changes? And what are the proposed causes? This is still being discussed and sorted out, still being actively discussed. And we will be discussing it because it was requested. This was requested by Portuguese Eagle, Jonathan, Jackie, Maya Boat, and Tater Boy. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. This is going to be a fun topic. I had a lot of fun looking into it. So thank you for requesting it. Like all of our topics are requested, if you have topic requests that you would like to submit, you can find a link down in the description for our submission form for topics. And before we get into the full episode, some quick announcements. Also down there in that description, you will find a link to our Patreon. That's very important. Because we have one of those, and it funds the podcast from top to bottom. And if you sign up on our Patreon, you can get all sorts of extra goodies, extra audio, extra posts extra interaction with us. We do monthly live streams with the patrons. And at a certain level, you can get your name shouted out here on the podcast. So we would like... that sound like? We would like to show you right here by thanking VJ, John, and Janice, Diprotodon, Professor Paul, and Douglas for joining us on Patreon and being new donators. Welcome and thank you, everybody. If you too would like those extra goodies or just to support us in our SciComm endeavors here on the podcast, you can find a link down there. You can also find links to the website and other ways to support us and so forth and get in contact with us. One of the other things we have is a mailing address where you can send us goodies and letters if you so choose. And we got a letter with some goodies recently from Jesse, Lucy, and Theodore. They sent us Drink koozies mm-hmm. in the form of a croc and a snake. Very thematic. It's totally on brand. Yeah. Very cool. They're super neat. Thank you so much. We love getting letters. Every now and then people will send us like a little letter that talks about their experience with the podcast. It is very common that people will send us pictures. Yeah. This one had a picture. Of, like, here's a the museum exhibit. That's very cool. It's very neat to get to know our listeners. Thank you so much for that. Thank- I'm so glad you're enjoying the podcast. My uh, koozie is currently displayed with the Jaws beer can uh, that I have downstairs. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I'll have to put some, so I'll find something to put the snake around. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. I like, I like getting to add fuzzy crocs to my collection. Next announcement we have is the fact that this is the last episode of September. By September. Which means next month is October. 
It is. Which means spooky time is coming up. Spooky all through October, as usual, will be speculatively evolving monsters. Absolutely. We've revealed our theme this year. It is dragons. Dragons. So check in every Saturday next month to see what kinds of dragons we can evolve via the rules of natural selection. And while that's going on, Hop on our social media, join our Discord, links in the episode description to become part of the ongoing discussion. Our fans get a huge kick out of Spooky, so get get involved if you want. Oh, it's so much fun. And this year we are doing something extra. We have the Spooky live stream in November on the 11th at 3 p.m., so keep an eye out and check in on that to have just extra discussion and chat with us about Spooky seasons uh, this year's and past. Yes. Also, speaking of fun episodes next month, this is 174, which means next is 175, and that ends in a five. That's a plants episode. So check in on our next episode. Allie will be joining us again to talk about plants. Excellent. Just want to give all the Allie fans out there a heads up. Just getting everybody excited. October is going to be full of cool stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. It, it, there's a lot going on. It's a great. <laughs> we have a great lineup. And we're coming off of great stuff because we just got back from Dragon Con. It was tons of fun. Our panels were great. We got to meet a bunch of people. We got to talk to a number of listeners and fans. Mm -hmm. It was lovely and wonderful. So thank you all who came to our panels. Thank you all who came to say hi. Thank you, everyone who made it so much fun. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you again. It really, it makes it it, that much more special for us to get to meet people and interact with people at events like that. Uh, and it was great. It's, so we are uh, we have begun thinking about next year. Yes, we, we will consider <laughs> we'll re-upping. We'll see in a year. <laughs> and with that, we can wrap up the announcements and move on to the first official section of the episode, the news. Every episode, we like to collect some recent science news from scientific research in the fields of paleontology, evolutionary biology, and earth sciences. David, what's the news to keep us up to date? My first bit of news is kind of on theme, uh, since we're talking this episode about a major transition in Earth ecosystems. I've got a news that's going to take us back to the early Cambrian, which is way before the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, but it's on theme. Yes. This is research in the journal Current Biology by Robert O'Flynn et al., and we will link to an article published by the Natural History Museum by James Ashworth. This paper describes a new species of thing from the early Cambrian. So we are right in the Cambrian explosion time frame of the appearance of a lot of familiar things, some weird stuff. The thing in this case is an arthropod. Ooh. Uh, Cambrian studies research into arthropod evolution often ends up circling around the Cambrian because that, like a lot of groups, that's when we start to see the origins of familiar early members of this group. Arthropods, of course, is the group that includes things like arachnids, insects, crustaceans, and so on. This new creature is called Kailinxia jangai, and it comes from the Chengjiang biota of China, which we've mentioned before. It is a Burgess Shale type locality which means it's full of just tons of really, really well-preserved fossils. It's very pretty. Dates to about 518 million years ago. This weird arthropod creature was first identified back in 2020, and it was noted in that original description, researchers noted interesting features of the head, including the eyes and uh, spiny appendages coming off of the head. Which is not, I mean, arthropods often will have appendages coming off of their head section. Yes. This study, newly published, CT scans the specimen to get an even better, more detailed, closer look to sort of reappraise what we know about this creature. And to correct some incorrect descriptions from the original study. Ooh. The appendages coming off the head were originally identified as appearing to be two pairs of single-branched appendages. So single-branched meaning it's just the one leg, as opposed to in many arthropods, they will have, each of their legs will actually have two parts to them. Yeah. With the CT scans, this study identified that there are actually four pairs of appendages, and they are two-branched, or biramous, like we see a lot of crustaceans, for example, have biramous appendages. 
The eyes have also been reassessed. The original study said it looked to have five eyes, which sounds weird, but there are other Cambrian creatures with five eyes. Opabinia has yep, five yep. eyes. This study with the CT scan was able to say, actually, there are only three eyes, which is weirder somehow. Mm -hmm. A pair of compound eyes, like we think of with a lot of insects, and then a middle eye. Yes. Uh, sitting in the middle. The other two structures that were originally uh, thought to be potentially eyes are parts of the head plate that the eyes sit on. Gotcha. The authors do note uh, that the middle eye, they, they, there's not much to say about that middle eye. It looks like a median eye based on the structure, based on where it's sitting. But they said that the parts we would need to be preserved, like the lens mm -hmm. to understand exactly what it's doing, we don't have. But there is a, there's an eye, extra eye right there in the middle. Neat. Altogether, this study allowed them to identify that the head has six segments. So this is something that comes up with arthropods. Their bodies are segmented. There are six segments of the head, including the sclerite that has the eyes on it, a pair of frontal appendages, and then those four pairs of double-branched appendages. What's cool about six segments is that that is what is seen across a lot of modern arthropods. Mm. You see that in insects. You see that in crustaceans. So this is an early sign of a very familiar arthropod form back in the Cambrian period. They did a phylogenetic analysis comparing with a bunch of other arthropods, which indicates, with the help of this specimen, that that six-segmented head is an ancestral feature. Yes. That that is something that showed up very early on, and groups like insects and crustaceans have held on to it. And the fact that Kai Lin Xiao has it is a good indicator that it is a close relative of those early true arthropods, potentially closer than anything else that we have. Ooh. Often when we're trying to understand the early evolution of arthropods, we want to find early true arthropods, but also their cousins. Yes. And so researchers will sometimes look at things like anomalocarids, which are thought to be close to that origin. This creature appears to be even closer. Yes. And therefore an even better indicator of what those early stages in arthropod evolution were like. Very cool. It is always fascinating to get to learn about the the origin of arthropod features because they are so alien to us. Mm -hmm. Like just anatomically speaking, they are so different from us bony animals that you get to have questions of like, how many parts their heads are. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's it, Cambrian fossils are always neat because they it ends up being stuff like, this is indicating the steps in the early evolution of arthropods. Yes. That group that has gone on to become just an absolutely ubiquitous group around the world, we're seeing the pieces coming together to make an arthropod. Exactly. Which is very cool. <sighs> very neat. Way to go, Cambrian. Yeah, no, good job. You done good work. My next news also has information or is looking at information about the early history and potential origins of a group. This time, our group looking at hominins and hominins, depending on exactly where the placement of certain fossils ends up. Mm -hmm. This is about a new fossil or a new analyzed fossil that, as the news articles have been saying, could potentially suggest a Eurasian origin for hominin, hominins. Hmm. This is research by Ayla Savim Errol et al. in Communications Biology, and the article we'll be linking to in our blog is by Charles Choi in Live Science. So we've talked about, you know, human and hominin evolution here on the podcast before. Uh, this is looking at a group of fossilates from the Mediterranean, and there has been debate about them and exactly where they fit into ape and hominin and hominin evolution in all. Current research has placed them in various categories, either as hominins, which is the African hominids or African apes that includes us and chimps and gorillas, that group. The hominins, which is us and our fossil relatives. Right, just to the human yes. lineage. Or stem hominids, which, as they put it, no more closely related to us than to orangutans. Right. So, sort of sort of on the periphery of great apes. Yes. 
So it's been debated where this group, you know, this kind of radiation of Mediterranean apes really should go. This new species and genus, this new genus and species, has gained a lot of attention because of some unique features. This has been named Anadoluvius turkey. It dates back to about 8.7 million years old, a site in Anatolia in Turkey, which is where the parts of its name come from. Mm -hmm. It is a well-preserved partial skull, including some of the facial structure and brain case. This was discovered back in 2015 and has now been described and published. They estimate that it probably weighed like 110, 130 pounds, so 50, 60 kilograms, about the size of a large male chimpanzee, to give you an idea. Noted some basic things, seem to have powerful jaws, large, thickly enameled teeth, so powerful teeth, likely eating tougher foods, you know, maybe even roots and stuff like... Mm -hmm. Makes me think of a gorilla yes. with those powerful jaws. They're they're chewing on some tougher things, you know, they're crushing stuff. They also know that that could likely mean that they spent more time on the ground where you would get access to that kind of food. Sure. Which I hadn't considered, that's interesting. And based on fossils found around it, like giraffes and zebras and rhinos and stuff like that it probably lived in a dry forest more similar to the kinds of places that the earliest humans are found in africa uh, rather than the actual like for like jungled places that a lot of the great apes are found today right so kind of kind of that environment this is important for a number of reasons one shows that mediterranean apes were very diverse you know this is another addition to the diversity there and it when analyzed with them shows seems to form a radiation you know, among those apes that seems to group with early hominines, so the African apes. So far, the members of this radiation are only known from Europe and the Anatolia areas. A few other, they mention a few other species from Greece and Turkey and Bulgaria. And if this placement is accurate, that they are a early radiation of hominines, this could suggest that the hominine lineage originated in Eurasia during the late Miocene, or at least some portion of it. Under this hypothesis, it would mean that hominines originated in Europe or the Eastern Mediterranean, and then later migrated to Africa between seven to nine million years ago, which is very different than the conventional view that apes and our ancestors evolved in Africa. Now, they also point out that it could be that this is a lineage that dispersed to Eurasia from Africa. This could be an early, a group that left early. Yes, that we just don't have that evidence of that, you know, in between Africa and Eurasia, that where they dispersed. And the fact that the current, you know, body of knowledge of fossils of great apes and humans doesn't support the origination in Europe. You know, this is kind of the one thing that seems like it could suggest that. But they do point out that the amount of diversity found in Eurasia would typically suggest a what they called in situ origin that mm -hmm. this seems like a lot of diversity for it just to have dispersed here and then diversified this much right it would typically looking at a situation like this it would make more sense if they evolved in that place so that is one bit of evidence that is one bit of suggestion for the Eurasian origin but they also said that that does not exclude a dispersal hypothesis it just leans a little bit toward right. an Eurasian origin. Warrants investigation. Yes. And they made sure to point out that this is talking about the common ancestor of hominines, not about the human lineage. They made very clear points to be like, <laughs> we're not saying humans started here. Right. The this ancestor... Is chimp bonobos. Yes. Us, that whole group. That very large, widely diverse group may have had origins here if this fossil grouping is accurate. Right. And either way, it's interesting because it either means that this was very different and that this lineage or had origins in a slightly different place than we would expect, or that there was this early branch and then diversification to another area so that we, we have more of this geographic diversity early on in that lineage. Yes. And the article, the news article made sure to point out that there are researchers who do not group this radiation with mm. hominines, but more closer to, you know, between or around the amount we're related to orangutans. Right. So that, Which may be more consistent with yes. other evidence. If uh, that's the case, then that gets rid of all of this, like, whoa. Right. This isn't quite as surprising if, yeah. if that's where this group falls out. Precisely. Uh, I saw one other part that mentioned that fossil hominines like this specimen. 
aren't found in Africa. Mm. So we do not see an example of them that would that seems to connect in Africa. Right. So this might be a group that is unique to this area. Yes. And they do point out that we have a poor fossil record for that time sure. in Africa. So it could be that we're missing the evidence of them coming into Africa or vice versa. But there is a lack of connection. Uh, and at the end of the article, the researchers cautioned they did not want this research to be misinterpreted or misused, <laughs> trying to make sure that this is not saying this is talking about where humans got our start, but where our ancestors for our ancestors right. would have gotten their start. Yes. Humans originated in Africa. Yes, that, that is not under debate here. That part we know. But the lineage that led to us could have potentially started elsewhere, depending on how this fossil group falls within our overall family tree. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Another one of those investigating the origins of a important lineage and... As usual, when we're looking at the earliest members of any particular group, they are often rarer and harder to find mm -hmm. because they were less common and it's farther back in time. So we end up having to work with less abundant examples in the fossil record. Yep, so yep. finds like this can be really informative. Yeah. One, you know, were you different because you were ancestral? Were you different because you diversified away from us very quick? Right. It can be very hard to tell. Well, my next bit of news is something uh, completely different. It's <laughs> in Asia, which is the sort of close to that's where my first one was. There we go. Anyway, this is about uh, fossil ravens nice. and insights into the distribution of ravens over time. This is research by Thomas Stidham, Jingmai O'Connor, and Jehung Lee in the Journal of Ornithology. And in the blog post, we will link to a uh, press release on Eureka Alert from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. The raven fossils, so ravens, the birds, the, the very famous blackbirds. In this case, these fossils come from Beijing. The site is Jokodian, or the Peking Man site. Yeah. Which is a late Pleistocene fossil site, so around or over 100,000 years old. So very recent compared to all of our other newses. This site has lots of fossil mammals, lots of birds, and famously early humans. Yeah. So uh, Peking Man, in quotes, was the name given to a famous find of Homo erectus from this site quite some time ago. So this site gets investigated quite a bit to understand the ecosystems that our ancestors and relatives lived alongside. This research examines some raven fossils from the Peking Man site. Specifically, two bones, a humerus, so upper arm bone, and tibiotarsus, so the shin bone, of a raven. These bones were actually identified a while ago and assigned to a new unique species, Corvus functionis. This study does a sort of reassessment of these bones. Let's see what more we can learn. And the main takeaway is that doing a detailed comparison of these bones to other raven species they identified it as not a new species. Oh. But actually, the northern raven, oh. Corvus corax, the species that we are very familiar with today. So they are revising, basically sinking that new species. They yes. are revising that previous identification. They identified a number of unique features. The abstract specifically mentioned on the humerus that allowed them to say this is the modern species or this is the modern lineage. This is Corvus corax, our northern raven. Now, on the one hand, that means it's not some cool new species that we can investigate. But on the other hand, it's interesting because that species doesn't live in Beijing today. Yeah. which Or historically. So there isn't a history of northern ravens in Beijing, which makes these fossils the first record of these ravens in that area. The authors also note that a recent study that I think some of these authors also published a couple years ago identified a fossil raven skull in Liaoning, another part of China, that one middle Pleistocene, about 500,000 years ago, also a place where ravens, if I understood correctly, aren't found today. So together, this is indicating that ravens, this species of raven, had a much broader distribution across China in the previous hundreds of thousands of years of the Pleistocene. This, of course, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one because so often when we talk about a thing was found in a new place, we're talking about entire lineages like 
the lineage of apes is in an unusual place. This is one species, but being able to track the distribution over time of one species is really important for us to understand what causes species to change their distribution over time, how they react to environmental changes, and in this particularly things like birds that we often study to understand how they respond to changes in their environments. Well, especially when we have the species still alive. Yes. And so we can actually track from there all the way to right now, like yes. this very instant. And that's cool. Now, when we're talking about changing distributions, especially across the Pleistocene, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is changing climate conditions. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting in this case is that the Beijing site with these raven fossils was a warmer time period, but the Liaoning site was a cooler and drier time period. Oh, compared to today? Compared to today. And ravens, as they noted, are not migratory. Yep. So this suggests that these birds were living in these places at these distinctly different climatic intervals, which could be a sign that they are actually quite resilient to changing climates, which is not really surprising. Ravens are are pretty intense. (laughs) Tough birds. (laughs) Which, uh, of course, very important for us to understand if we're trying to determine how birds are going to react to climate change, but also then raises the question of if it wasn't, if climate's not the reason that ravens aren't in those places today, then why aren't they, why has their distribution changed? Mm -hmm. And the answer that the authors propose is that ravens are big deal scavengers. Oh. And at the end of the Pleistocene, we lose a lot of our big herbivores in that region, elephants, rhinos, and such. And when the big herbivores disappear, we also lose things like hyenas and bears, which would have been predating those animals, but also scavenging them. Mm-hmm. So ravens might have vanished from those regions, not because directly the climate forced them out, but because changes to their ecosystems. They lost a food source when the big animals vanished from those regions. That That's very interesting. Yeah. Another angle that they mentioned in both the paper and the press release is that, uh, and they, they didn't, as far as I could see, go into any real detail in this, but just the interesting thought that ravens historically are a major part of human culture. Mm. So the idea of finding ravens going back over a hundred thousand years at a site that is also famous for early human fossils is a neat indication that our own ancestors have been living alongside and potentially interacting with these birds for quite a long time. Yeah. How we, long? <laughs> yeah. How long have you been important? Were you, were we, or were our ancestors scavenging alongside ravens? Yes. Were we noting how clever and, and yeah. tricky you were? Were we following them yes. to find like, That's a cool, again, I I don't know that there are any conclusions drawn from this pair Mm -hmm. of fossils, but it's an interesting thing to know that part of that ecosystem was ravens and our own ancestors and cousins. Very cool. I always find it exciting when we find unexpected fossil evidence for a modern group and species because it's expanding their story. And I feel like it's a nice reminder that Even the animals around today that we are used to had dynamic histories. Yeah. And that what we see nowadays is not just what is the case for them. You know, they were living places they don't live now. And they were living alongside animals that they don't live alongside now. Like, they have been around and experienced the changing of Earth just like those that also, you know, just like the animals that went extinct before them. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice reminder of... That we are still in the history of Earth. It's not a separate thing from today. Yes. Very cool. Well, my last bit of news. I will bring it right into the topic of the episode because this is about marine evolution in the Mesozoic. Specifically, long necks in the group that includes plesiosaurs. Mm -hmm. This is research by Chi Ling Liu et al. in BMC Ecology and Evolution. And the article is by... Ragakshi Dixit in Interesting Engineering. So, long necks, we've talked about plesiosaurs. We had a whole episode. We sure did, episode 72. Plesiosaurs were your long-necked marine reptiles that were extremely successful in Earth's oceans during the Mesozoic. 
including things like Plesiosaurus, but also the Lasmosaurus and that group. They are members of a overall group called Sauropterygians, which includes them and some of their relatives, some of which also had neck elongation happening, which is an interesting area of study in vertebrates in general, because there are a number of groups that have elongated their necks. Mm -hmm. We've also talked about giraffes. Yep, 159. And sauropods. 101. And so this is a trend we see. This research is looking into this trend within sauropterygians, particularly because of a new specimen. From their overall fossil record, we know that long necks had arisen in this group by the early Triassic. This new specimen is also from the early Triassic. It's been named Chusaurus shangensis. This is a pachypleurosaurid, which is a member of the sauropterygians. There are actually two specimens to this new spe uh, genus and species. It was found in China and dates back to about 248 million years old, making it one of the oldest known for this group. Yeah, right at the beginning of the Triassic. Yes, so this is very, very early in the evolution of this group. The pachypleurosaurs were a group of small marine predators kind of lizard-shaped in their body, you know, four little legs. They hadn't quite gotten to the flippers of plesiosaurs, but they were aquatic. Likely they are considered to either be close to or potentially plesiosaur ancestors. Mm -hmm. So this this is either the group that led to plesiosaurs or are probably very similar to what led to plesiosaurs. They have long necks. Uh, they extended it by adding neck bones. Okay. You know, some extend the bone like giraffes do. These added, they could have up to or more than 25 neck bones in their uh, long, long necks. That could be the majority of their body length, especially in later groups. Chusaurus shows many of the key features for this group, especially for the mid middle Triassic members, but has a relatively short neck huh. compared to other members. Mm. Its neck is only... 0.48 of its body length, while others in the Middle Triassic were up to 0.8 or more, and only had 17 vertebra compared to its later cousins. So it has a still long neck. Right. 50% of its body length is still neck. Yes. But it's not 80% of the body length. Yes. Like in some of those others. <laughs> so it, it is notably shorter compared to other members of its group, which is letting them look at the pace of neck evolution and elongation in this group. They also note that the neck suggests it probably was well-suited for catching fast-moving prey. To look at the evolutionary rates, they did a comparative analysis with other members to show neck evolution elongation occurred rapidly in all the Triassic Eosauropterygians, so the groups leading up to that lineage, seemingly over the span of about 5 million years. So very, very quickly. And then after that, the rate of elongation began to decelerate. So slow down. One of the potential answers for why this happened so dramatically early in the Triassic is that it was after the end Permian mass extinction, where now a lot of the previous rulers of the sea had died. There's a lot of ecological space to explore. Exactly. So you got a potentially a radiation of neck shapes. Yes. And so it allowed for you know, open niches to be filled by new members. And evidently the way they evolved to fill in some of those niches was to get long necks very quickly. Yeah. Noting that this group seems to have appeared about 4 million years after the extinction. And then that first 5 million getting very long necks. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it was a very quick response. And this new fossil has helped kind of uh, uh, calibrate the speed at which it was happening. Yeah. Like a lot of other trends we've talked about on the podcast, long necks are a thing that invertebrates has evolved many times. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, we've talked about them. And the question of how and why and at what pace did those long necks evolve is an interesting question, but it's also different for every one of those lineages. Yes, because they're all like, using them very differently. They all have different ancestry. They all live in different parts of their ecosystem. So the answer to how did the giraffes get their long necks is different to from the answer to how did plesiosaurs and their cousins get their long necks. Yeah, it's weird. That's very cool. And with that, we can wrap up the news and move nicely into our main topic of the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. I assume that everyone was getting long necks. Yes, edges the long necks all over the place. That's why we have all so many long-necked marine creatures today. <laughs> hmm. This is 
very well connected to some of the things talked about in this news in that this was a time of major turnover Mm -hmm. and major adjustment potentially linked to great disturbances in the ocean like the Permian. So we'll talk about what exactly that revolution looked like after the break. The Mesozoic Marine Revolution is a name that I very much appreciate because it it describes exactly what it is. Says what it is. Yes. Not like the Cambrian explosion. (laughs) Right, right. Which which has been debated back and forth over whether or not that's the right name for it. Absolutely. And there's... Or the Big Bang. Of course. A little bit of debate with this one, too. Sure. As always, there is. But the name tells you what you're getting in for. The idea is there in the name. It tells you when, it tells you where, and it tells you what. Exactly. Precisely. (laughs) This is an event or series of events that seem to have taken place, at least mostly in the Mesozoic, where that's where a lot of the peaks happened, that led to a what is often, you'll see, described as a restructuring mostly focused on shallow marine ecosystems yes, under new management yes that the way, the dynamics the patterns the players of those habitats before this event were notably different than the ones after this event mm-hmm. and so this is often pointed at as when the oceans really start at least this aspect of it started to become like today like we think of the interactions in the tidal and coastal and reef areas of the world. The pattern most noted is that this seems to have been a major, a time of major increase in predation rates and predation types with the responding adaptations of prey for in more intense defensive behaviors and anatomy. That seems to be at the core of this revolution. And classically, this was placed within the Cretaceous, that really this is when it kicked off or was mostly happening. Earliest you know, studies looking into the structure of marine ecosystems during this time, go back to like 1831 when a study tried to reconstruct the Jurassic seascape of Dorset, based mostly off of Mary Anning's findings. Mm-hmm. Then some of the early literature started to notice the importance of the interactions in animals affecting the dynamics. That was when predation in the marine ecosystem really started to kind of gain attention. By the 1970s, they started to note that these probably are really important to the pattern of evolution and and ecosystem that we're seeing. The concept of the MMR, as you'll often see it shortened, was formalized in 1977. Where it was when it was noticed that there was a major increase in particularly gastropods, so you know, snails, shell defenses during the Mesozoic, that their shells got more defensive with thicker shells, enhanced ornamentation, so those spines and spikes that you'll see on some snail shells, more tightly coiled shells, and a higher frequency of repair noticed on shells from damage. Oh, it's more healing, yes. more, more injuries being healed. So it just seems like the shells were getting beat up more and getting ready for a fight, more notably during the Mesozoic. Interesting. Uh, there are a lot of studies, especially from that general, like the 1970s and that part of paleontology history, where a number of studies were done that were basically looking at patterns and like all right let's look at seashells over 500 million years and see what happens because seashells are going to show trends in major shifts in marine ecosystems throughout time so it doesn't at all surprise me that that was some of the first clues that people went the shells are doing something weird we are going to be talking about shells so much this episode the whole shells i was putting your request now yes for uh, the episode about shells. there are so many things because shells fossilized well they are common tons of different organisms with different kinds of shells fossilized so they let us do those massive views what they also noticed was that this seemed to coincide with radiations in durophagous predators things eating hard-shelled animals. Makes a lot of sense. So we see more defensive shells showing up and things that would have been good at eating those shells, mostly fish and crustaceans, as well as increased drilling predation, things drilling through the shells. And this got that idea of, it really seems like something big happened here. 
that this is when we see a big turnover of groups and lifestyles. And it seems that this interaction of predation and defense is really core to it. This is when that the idea of the Mesozoic Marine Revolution really set in. Other studies also noticed co- that it coincided with things like increased substrate disturbance, what's known as bioturbation. This is both from burrowers, you know, literally just digging down into the sediment. Right, stuff messing with the sediment uh, on the bottom of these shallow floors so you get burrows and churned up dirt and stuff. Yep, yep. And grazers. Yep. Increased grazing is noticed during this time. Uh, what's sometimes called bioeroders, things scraping at rocks to get food or, you know, for other reasons. Yeah. Talk, speaking of snails, mm-hmm. very famous for doing that today. Which both of those can also be connected to predation, either to hide from predators or things eating other things. It might be eating algae, but could also be eating, you know, uh, bacteria or other small organisms. And they notice that a lot of groups seem to shift into deeper habitats, away from shallows or into the deep. Mainly your stationary groups that aren't going to be able to run and hide as well seem to have been fleeing to the depths, (laughs) so to speak. This includes bivalves and echinoids, or urchins, as well as brachiopods and famously the stalked crinoids. Yeah, I was was just thinking, Mm -hmm. is this one crinoids? Because we talk so much about how in the Paleozoic especially, crinoids, your sea lilies, are everywhere in the fossil record. And people are sometimes taken by surprise to learn that they're still around today. Yes. Because they're so uncommon in the type of marine habitats that we typically think of. So all of this seems to go together that predation increased, you know, intensified is how I saw it described many a time. And prey responded by either beefing up defenses or hiding. Mm-hmm. And this really became one of the core concepts and ideas around the MMR. This led to the development of the escalation hypothesis. This was put forth by Girat Vermeij, who is a paleoecologist and evolutionary biologist. And this is the idea of enemy-directed evolution. This is the you know the actual title for an arms race. Right. We've we've used the term, mm-hmm. and if you uh, if you've studied biology at all, there's a very good chance. You've come across this term, evolutionary arms race. This is a version of that. The concept of escalation is that either predator prey or competition being the main driving force for diversification and new adaptations, forcing quote unquote combatants in an ecosystem to compete with one another to either try to survive each other or to outdo each other. And you get that escalation of features constantly increasing yes one group evolves to be better at predation other groups are going to end up evolving to be better at defense it's that scene from the end of batman begins yes exactly (laughs) yes i also saw this described as a top down version of evolution that you're getting pressure from predators on top and it's driving evolution in the prey below which then causes evolution in the predators up top right the big thing that the MMR led to is the dominance of what is called the modern evolutionary fauna. After the MMR, we have oceans and the groups that we recognize today. Uh, and this is another place where it's very important to note, and I, it, I already get the impression this is going to become clear as we go through the episode. When we do these big, large-scale studies of ecosystems in the ocean, we are almost exclusively talking about invertebrates. Oh, yeah. It is usually, it's bivalves, it's snails, it's stuff like that. That tends to be the structure we're looking at. Yes. And that is definitely, because those are the ones also doing most of the work in the shallows of the ocean. Yes. Period. They're They're also making up the vast majority of the fossil record. Yes. So these are big time players in both the ecosystem and our knowledge of it. Yes. During this event and after it, we see many modern groups diversify. Many of the most important modern predatory groups have late Mesozoic origins lining up with this revolution. The modern diversity of both our modern cephalopod groups emerge and a major radiation of most ray-fin fish groups is during this time. So a lot of our key ocean players today show up or become as diverse as they are now during this time. Mm -hmm. Now, many of these lineages go back before this, so not to get the idea sure. that they started here, many of them go back before the Mesozoic into the Paleozoic, 
but the full displacement of that Paleozoic group of uh, of players, of faunas, starts to switch over and is ended with the end Permian, the Great Dying, when just huge chunks of Earth's diversity in life was killed off and kind of reset the board, beginning the Mesozoic and leading into this marine revolution, allowing for the modern faunas to step in and really take over. This is when we see a lot of the groups that aren't represented in, especially like Cambrian groups that, you know, a lot of lineages got their start here. This is when we see the ones that weren't represented there Mm -hmm. show up and start to take a stand. This shift can be kind of summed up that in the Paleozoic, a lot of the main players in these groups were sedentary. So, you know, sitting on the seafloor and suspension feeders. So pulling stuff out of the water. Once again, crinoids yep. being a quintessential example. That this, this is a, more of a garden habitat than uh, uh, we have now. The modern shift led to a what will often be called a more high metabolism or energetic fauna. Yeah, there's a lot more moving happening. Yes. Even the ones that are still, you know, set in tend to be more active organisms still. We still have suspension feeders, but now there's also deposit feeders and active predators being a more common role in the ecosystem. And we see a increase in the types of modes of life used, utilized during this time. And I saw one thing note that they were up to their present levels by the late Cenozoic, which there are some indications that this revolution started in the Mesozoic and then has could be seen as continuing up until Mm -hmm. things kind of got to where we recognize them today or, you know, shortly before today. So let's talk about the timing. The timing traditionally was kind of simplified as later part of the Mesozoic, typically kicking off in the early Cretaceous. And that was why it was the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. It was kind of a Cretaceous thing. Now with more up-to-date knowledge and wider surveying, we can see that there's more pulses than that, and it is not a singular event. I saw one thing called it a, the classic one was a rising crescendo. That was the classic idea. Okay. Now we realize ah, it's much more of kind of pulsed events, and it's more spread out and not a single big massive episode. We also note that differing adaptations and guilds happen and come to rise at different parts mm-hmm. and during these different pulses so a multi-phase yes. establishing of these ecosystems with different members playing more heavily during different parts yeah for instance in the triassic in the late triassic we do notice kind of the initial pulse that could be attributed to this revolution and mainly we see it in crushing vertebrates things crushing hard-shelled stuff there's a rise in that group and that's the first kind of event that syncs up with this overall revolution. Right. And we see more animals with rock-shaped crushing teeth, those exactly. sort of durophagous adaptations. Yes. So we see that rise in crushing behavior. There's then also a pattern with two distinctive episodes for defensive adaptations noticed. So it's, there's kind of also separate patterns with when we really note seeing the predators and when we note seeing the defenses. We don't always get that information from both sides for all times. Sometimes one preserves better than the other. The late Triassic, early Jurassic, there is a notable increase in defenses. And the middle to late Cretaceous is the other episode, with it being a bit more pronounced in the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. So the Cretaceous still seems to be an epicenter, so to speak. But we now know there are more events to it in the Mesozoic. We've also now been able to notice that there are similar patterns noticed in the Paleozoic before we even get to the Mesozoic. Yeah, so setting the stage. Exactly. No simple pithy name Mm-mm. of an event or phenomenon in nature survives the discovering of further evidence. Precisely. <laughs> like, we have uh, uh, evidence from the Middle Paleozoic showing increased damage and evidence of predation on prey fossils. And the Cambrian explosion is often another event in Earth's history pointed at being driven by predation and prey response, escalation, and there are evidences of shelly attacks, you know, predators specializing in hard-shelled organisms, and we see an increase in shelly fossils during that time, 
thought to be a defensive response to the rise in predation. Yes. One and of the things the, thought to potentially drive the Cambrian explosion. Yes. The Cambrian explosion is being itself absolutely a marine revolution. Yes. It's not a Mesozoic marine revolution by definition, but it is a very similar period of time. And so very often these earlier events have been connected to this Mesozoic revolution. Uh, there's times in the Middle Devonian where it is noted that there's a rapid radiation of durophagous fish, mm -hmm. where fish were getting really big and were getting good at chewing on tough prey. We also see holes drilled in echinoderms and brachi brachiopods during that time. So this is another time where it seems like there was a rise in predation, specifically on hard-shelled prey and a response by prey items, with many of them getting more defensive and more spiny. So it is really... Important to remember that even though it's named the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, we will mostly be focusing in the Mesozoic since that's where some of the major events happen close together. This pattern does not end and begin in the Mesozoic. It stretches out way before it and continued after it. Right. The, the Mesozoic Marine Revolution itself is sort of part of a... Uh, Part of a long tradition yes. of this sort of shift in marine ecosystems. Precisely. And it was just a particularly beefy one. Mm -hmm. It was just a really notable one and very clear to researchers to notice the pattern here. So as far as that pattern in the Mesozoic goes, we start with the Permian Mass extinction wipes out a lot of your Paleozoic players. At episode 45? Notably, the players during that time would have been majorly brachiopods, crinoids, trilobites, and graptolites, which are like colonial filter feeders. And then after that, the more modern players come in, bivalves, gastropods, echinoids, urchins, and your more modern fish. This has often been posited as the kickoff event for the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. Right. If you Even if we did have... These shifts throughout the Paleozoic, these sort of predecessors, the biggest mass extinction known in Earth history is going to be a good catalyst for yes. making change. And so, like, the, you know, the Mesozoic Marine Revolution is still a notable period of this trend. Yes. And it seems to have been kicked off when all the old members were killed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Triassic does show some... You know, major events, the late Triassic has been noted with some of those increases. There's also some rapid increases in ecological disparity of, of marine animals filling different ecological roles. But generally, the Triassic is seen kind of as a more sluggish period, along with the Jurassic. The Jurassic is a bit less talked about. It's not clear whether this is a legitimate gap or whether this is a lack of evidence, but the bulk of the Triassic and most of the Jurassic seem to not really have as much going on with these trends, at least. Though I did see one thing noting that we do see high levels of ecological uh, diversity, disparity, again, at the end of the Jurassic and going into the Cretaceous. And then the Cretaceous is when things really seem to solidly kick off, mm -hmm. especially by the mid and into the late Cretaceous. We see the height of diversification for many of the groups, and then much of this continued into the Cenozoic with still some later events, but I didn't see any noted as heavily. But it didn't just end with the Cretaceous and now we had oceans. We did still have some of these patterns continuing to lead us to what we have today. And all throughout this, one of the major trends is that it seems there was a increase in what's called energy budgets that the energy being utilized and evidently available to life was increasing throughout this event, hmm. leading to more active, more diverse, more variable, more specialized ways of life and defense for both predator and prey. As far as who was concocting this revolution, who was participating in it, uh, it is mainly focused on predator and prey. Of course, there are other dynamics, parasitism and, you know, even mutualistic patterns, but the heaviest focus is on predator-prey relationships. For predators, there are two main things that get focused on. For the durophagous predators, the tough food-eating predators, crushing predators, and drilling predators. Mm -hmm. Crushing is straightforward, like you mentioned. 
tough teeth, strong claws. I'm going to break you open and get to the meat inside. Right. There are a lot of fish that do this with beaks or with teeth. Mm Mm-hmm. Crabs famously have good crushing appendages, things like that. Stingrays are one of the ones Mm -hmm. I always think of first with having those flat anvil teeth for just smashing shells. There are usually two main ways you study this in the fossil record. Either by seeing a crushing structure on a predator, the things we just mentioned, or crushing damage on a prey item. By seeing crushed things. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Some of these can be hard to identify, but there are some that are very indicative. Uh, Evidently, crabs will chip away at the aperture, which is the opening to snail shells, in a very particular way Hmm. that can be identified because they're still doing it today. Yeah. So we can say, yep, that is a crab did that for sure. That's cool. Yep. And we see patterns in this crushing behavior. Mentioned earlier that the late Triassic is one of the notable times that it is noticed. There are also times in the after the Mesozoic that we notice that evidence that it was still rapidly diversifying even past the Mesozoic into the Cenozoic, likely because of fish and crabs. Those are the two groups that seem to be doing it quite heavily. Drilling predation, though, is the star of the show. This is the one that you will see talked about most regularly and studied most often, even if nowadays I think it is probably one of the less often... Like, I I don't see it discussed, and I often find people surprised Mm -hmm. when you talk about the fact that there are predators who will drill through the shells and that those predators usually often have their own shells. Yes. (laughs) Drilling predation happens today all over the place, mostly by snails. Yes. Snails are the big players when it comes to drilling. There are multiple groups that do this. They have different mechanisms. There are two main groups that are kind of the big drilling snails. And they're still around today. The Natissidae, which are your moon snails. And the Marissidae, which are your murex or rock snails. These are big, big time snail predatory snail groups that mainly feed by drilling through the shell of their prey items which are often other mollusks this could be other snails it can be bivalves there's ones that feed on echinoderms you know sea stars in their cut like there's a wide variety here and not all of them are predatory and not all of them predate in this way there are some that just engulf with their foot and smother and digest their prey without any drilling but If you go to the beach and you find a seashell with a perfect circular hole that is often countersunk, Mm -hmm. these are very, very characteristic holes, that probably was made by a snail. Yes. Shout out to our pal Ranjeev, who from our Spotlight series several years ago, who is the person that I learned from that you can identify the type of snail based on the hole in the clamshell. Yes. Which is very cool. And that's because these two groups do tend to hunt differently. Uh, moon snails are tend to be a bit more consistent. They tend to envelop the prey with their foot. You know, so that's the, the soft under part of the snail. They have a very wide one and just wrap it around the prey. It's the big hug. Some of them will just, as many papers called it, suffocate the prey that mm-hmm. way. The last hug. But many will use the accessory boring organ, or ABO which is in their proboscis, which is a part of their radula, which is the scraping mechanism that snails use to graze usually. Yes, (laughs) their quote-unquote tongue. Yep, their toothy tongue. That mixed with digestive secretions, they will scrape away and drill a hole into the organism and then pump it full of digestive fluids and just slurp up the organism from inside its own shell. Mm -hmm. The... Murex snails will do very similar things. It's that they usually just crawl on top of whatever their prey is. They don't engulf it. Mm -hmm. And their boring organ is located in their foot. It's not their mouth part. Interesting. I couldn't find a description of exactly what the structure was, but it one paper did denote that they bore differently. And so their holes are a little less distinct and perfect than the moon snails but can still usually be identified as to you know to this group. Yeah. So they they kick a hole in the ba- shell. Basically. <laughs> there are other drilling gastropods. The Caseidae is one, the Illuminidae is another. So these are not the only players, but these are like 
the big name groups, if you look up Drilling Snail, it's probably going to come back with one of these. Like, mm-hmm. Moon Snail is the one that is, like, the big, like, if you just Google Predatory Drilling Snail, Moon Snail yeah. picture will probably come up first. Though they are not the only ones out drilling in the ocean, octopoids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They can also drill holes. They are also durophagous feeders, like a yeah, mini squid and octopus. Has octopus. That yeah. beak. And they will crush into crabs and mussels mm-hmm. and hard shelled animals. But some octopoids will drill a hole in the shell, not crush it, and then inject their venomous saliva in there to either relax or paralyze the mussels to then get in and feed. Interesting. Now, given that we're talking about octopuses and cephalopods, I assume that the structure they're using to drill with is just a power drill. Right, right. That they have constructed <laughs> and invented electricity. And it's just a just table drill, drill that just, they bring yeah. you over to. It's just shop class, and they're just bringing in clamshells. Yep, yep. Uh, I did see one fun note when it comes to octopoids is that they are extremely soft-bodied animals. So often, this is a better record of their presence in the fossil record. Oh, yeah. Than them themselves. <laughs> yeah, octopus bite marks are, you're going to find more of those than you're going to find <laughs> octopuses. So, another benefit. <laughs> well, the, 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 the fossil record of cephalopods, as we've discussed, episode 16, is very funny because you often have to look at other organisms. Yep. Like, <laughs> have you ever uh, eaten one of these? Could you please tell us about it? <laughs> a, a substantial amount of our fossil record of squid and squid-like things comes from stuff like ichthyosaurs and yes. sperm whales. <laughs> <laughs> the original collectors. Yes. We do notice some interesting patterns in the history of drill holes in the oceans. I saw a noted two big phases of moderate to high frequency of drill holes noted in the fossil record. Once in the Cambrian to Carboniferous and once in the late Cretaceous into more recent times which seems to be separated by a period of low frequency from the Permian to early Cretaceous. Hmm. So this is part of that note of like crushing predators were more notable in the earlier Mesozoic. Drilling didn't seem to be as big until the end. So not all of the changes that were happening in this revolution happened all during each pulse. Yeah, interesting. They noted that that final phase during the Cretaceous has like has been attributed to the muricid and naticid sna- uh, snails, because it's likely, based on the evidence, that neither of them existed before the early Cretaceous. Oh, so gotcha. it seems like they came around in the Cretaceous and then caused a whole bunch of drill holes in yep. the late Cretaceous. <laughs> we also run into interesting problems with this one of the fact that those ones in the Paleozoic before the Mesozoic, we aren't sure who's making those holes. Mm-hmm. It could be other gastropods. It could be just other drillers that we may or may not have fossils of because the drilling structure may or may not have fossilized. So there are some mystery holes in and around these events. Another important aspect of this one is the prey items, which are mostly mollusks. Uh, One study that looked at 3,380 instances of drill hole predation, 77% of them are mollusks. So most of these snails are attacking other mollusks bivalves, and other snails. There are some interesting patterns. Most of these seem to be groups like oysters and clams, while some rudest clams, which is a famous group during the Jurassic to Cretaceous, that were bivalves that were kind of box-shaped or, or tower-shaped, very odd compared to a lot of our you know bivalves today. There's almost no record of drill holes on them. Hmm. So they weren't being targeted, it seems, but a lot of the groups that are still targeted to today were so. Interesting. The rudest had some sort of agreement. They, I the saw snails. one thing hypothesize that maybe they had some sort of secretion defense or some mm. extra defense that others didn't. Yeah. That made them less palatable. Rudists are also famous in some times and places for being reef builders yes. and, and very important foundational members. So my joke about them having an agreement, there it could also be that there was some <laughs> sort of symbiotic yes. relationship. That it behooved the snails not to be destroying Mm -hmm. those rudists. So yeah, there's some interesting patterns, some of which we just don't have answers for yet, and Mm -hmm. there's no clear reason why. There are also some groups that are just much better represented than others, even though they were present. You know, so there's definitely not a 100% for just all shelled creatures were getting drilled and all drilling things were doing it. 
there's some interesting patterns to when and who the was doing the drilling and getting drilled. Yeah. So it's it's a very complex pattern of association between predator and prey or, and over time. Another important feature is burrowers. The mm-hmm. ones turning up the s- substrate, that bioturbation that we mentioned, increased during this time. We see more utilization of the substrate, of the sediment, during this time. This includes a lot of the groups that are doing it today. Worms are definitely major burrow makers, even though we don't usually have what the worm was that made the burrows during this time. But we've got the burrow. we got lots of worm burrows. We've got lots of bivalves. Many of your, you know, your your clams and stuff and are really good at uh, uh, digging in, but you also get specialists like ship uh, shipworms, which can like bore into wood mm-hmm. and bore into heart. I think there's even one today that can do it into limestone. Like you get some specialists that can really dig into hard substrate. Echinoderms were the ones that I saw noted a bit more than others, especially your irregular echinoderms, which are things like sand dollars and sea biscuits and heart urchins. So echinodermata overall includes sea stars and urchins and their cousins. Sea sea stars and urchins being the famous examples. Yep. And then I like that the others are the irregular ones. Yep, yep. And then all the rest. (laughs) Echinoids are your urchins and irregular echinoids are basically your non-symmetrical your non-spherical urchins, yes. they have a front end, kind of. Right. They've got a uh, uh, front and back, sort of, with the way they're shaped. Which is a weird thing for an echinoderm to have. Yes, extremely, which is why they're irregular. <laughs> Aberrant. They are big-time burrowers. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of urchins are walking around the surface. Same with a lot of sea stars. These are very notable for digging down. Uh, you'll see this with sand dollars if you ever find one on the beach, and it's washed up, it'll immediately start digging itself back down into the sand again. Mm -hmm. And they will create notable structures, specifically uh, spatangoid heart urchins, which are the most diverse group of the irregulars today and were major players with the burrow making during this time. You'll see things, they'll make channels for drainage, both of getting water in and fecal matter out so we can recognize their burrows. But by far the biggest burrow makers were crustaceans. Mm -hmm. These specifically decapod crustaceans, which is your crab, lobster, shrimp group. These were big time. They're big time players today in making burrows, but they were majorly notable during the MMR. We see increases in the number of burrows that seem to match decapod burrows throughout the Mesozoic, and some of these patterns match up with a lot of the other patterns noticed with other evidence for the MMR. The Triassic was only slightly higher than burrows in the Paleozoic, and along with body fossils from that time indicate that their diversity, decapod diversity, was fairly low during that time. So a slight increase in the Jurassic, and then with them becoming the dominant uh, uh, players in the Cretaceous, both with a greater diversity of body fossils and of dec- of burrows, both in number and diversity of burrow type. So we also see it following similar patterns, but not all of the patterns. So once again, not all the things are happening at every part of the MMR. And then one of the final things notable here is the bioeroders, the things scraping and grazing off of rocks. These include a ton of different players, Sponges can leave marks on rocks. Your snails can be scraping things up. Bivalves can be burrowing down or making homes. Chitons, which are cousins of your gastropods, are also going around scraping up food. Urchins, worms. There's also a bunch of vertebrates that can be chomping on the surface of rocks to feed. Parrotfish are famous for crunching on coral to get to that food. and Algae and fungi and foraminiferans and cyanobacteria can cause microbioerosion. So we get all sorts of things etching and eating at and leaving marks on rocks increasing during this time. This could be due to where the organism was. Sponges leave boring holes, rounded chambers where they were kind of rooted. You get that also with crustaceans like barnacles that lock themselves down to a surface. But then grazing behavior from snail, you know, non-predatory snails that are scraping up algae with their radulas 
along with the slime trail they leave, can leave a very con- a very characteristic pattern on rock to show that snails were feeding there. You also can get a distinctive five scrape pattern from urchins grazing because they have five teeth, the Aristotle's lantern in their mouth that can leave a very notable scar on rocks. And so it wasn't just the shell smashers and shelled animals. It, there, we also see an increase in these feeding habits and, and living habits, leaving marks on the actual stone of the environment. And then the last general bit of like overall patterns I wanted to mention was environmental, like where it was happening, what environments it was noticed in, because there are some trends, but also a lot of big questions as to how much was it or wasn't it happening in different types of environments. Most assume, as is often the case, that it will likely be stronger in lower latitudes where we have warmer waters and typically more active oceans as far as we know. But this is really hard to confirm just because we do not have uniform evidence from the different latitudes around the world. Most of our studies tend to lean towards locations from Europe and North America. And so the paleotropics are relatively undersurveyed. And most of our evidence is from the intertidal zone. And yet still most most of those are mid-latitudes. So it's not entirely sure if there really is a correlation with how close to the equator things were as to the intensity of the revolution. It was noted that there is a difference between the ocean basins, that gastropod defenses are better developed in the Pacific and Indian Oceans than they are in the Atlantic Oceans. Hmm. So there seems to have been a at least different response in your snail shell defenses in parts of the world than others. There's also been debate as to how much difference there is between the this trend happening in the shallows versus deep water. Uh, many have held that a lot of groups moved into deeper water to avoid the increase in predation, you know, to flee from it. This has been noted with things like some modern groups of brachiopods marking the evidence of predation on their shells today seems to lessen the deeper you go. So there does seem to be some support that they are avoiding damage by being deeper and deeper and avoiding those shallow water predators. This was classically the idea with crinoids, Mm -hmm. as we talked about earlier. Crinoids, or sea lilies, are extremely common in around the world in many depths of the ocean before the Mesozoic, and then after the marine and during the marine revolution become less and less common in the shallows till today they are no longer found shallower than fairly deep waters. Mm -hmm. Today they are really only known from deep waters. The only members known in shallow waters are the more mobile members that can swim and potentially avoid predators. So the less mobile members seem to have fled to deep waters. We do note you know, damage on crinoids during this time of bite marks, most likely from fish, on the arms and stalks, as well as evidence of them sacrificing limbs Mm -hmm. to get away from predators. There are evidences of increase in these uh, damage markings during the Mesozoic, at least in the shallow habitats where crinoids are found, so it does seem that they were getting hit harder by predators along with increased rates of regenerating arms. And there's less evidence from the deep sea crinoids during that time of bite marks and and such damage. But there are later records of shallow water crinoids after the Cretaceous. And previously, these were seen as potentially reinvasions, but others have suggested that this might mean that they didn't all migrate to the depth all at once. Mm Mm-hmm. And that some of them stuck around. Some of them stuck around. So maybe they weren't, they didn't all respond the same way. Maybe it was different in different parts of the globe. Maybe it happened with different groups at different times. Or maybe that's not why they went to the depths. Mm-hmm. Maybe they weren't chased there. Maybe it's been a different pattern. There's something else that caused them to become relegated to the deep water. Yeah. This is noted by the fact that There are some populations that don't seem to show, in modern day studies, don't seem to show less predation in deep water communities. Hmm. So it's not always a one-to-one. There may not, you may not be getting all the refuge we initially think you would be going down into the depth. And this is especially true for deep sea vents and seep communities, which we talked about in the deep sea episode. Mm -hmm. 128. These are chemically fueled habitats with either heated by 
you know, molten rock deep down and coming up as chemically rich hot water or seeps of differing chemicals coming up through the rock, creating these areas where bacteria can feed and process off of those chemicals and then organisms can benefit from those bacterial communities. It has often been wondered, even you know, if the deep is a place where you can flee from predators, most of the deep is a barren wasteland. Right. These aren't. Do these show the same pattern of the Mesozoic Marine Revolution? Mm -hmm. And it's hard to tell because these sites don't always preserve and we don't have a clear way to always observe predation, even today. So it usually has to be secondhand, even with today's studies. But there are bits and pieces of evidence that there was an increase in the similar kind of predation rates, even at these sites. Certain brachiopods known from Devonian uh, all the way up to Cretaceous seep deposits show repaired shell damage. There is one site noted from the Jurassic that showed a particularly high, you know, at least 10% of the ones found showing repaired damage, which seemed to be actually a bit higher than their non-seep brachiopod uh, members. There's also drill holes noted from bivalves at seeps in the late Cretaceous. And so there's potential that there was a similar pattern going on in these more concentrated deep sea communities. But that's still kind of a, a, a mysterious bit of the equation. And then the final thing to mention is freshwater systems, mm -hmm. which this is the marine revolution. So it's usually focused there. But people have looked to see, was this happening in all waterways? And the answer is it doesn't seem as much. It doesn't seem like it was happening as much in freshwater systems, which is possibly due to just fundamental differences between freshwater and oceanic uh, you know, marine habitats. Even today, there are fewer durophagous predators. Like that's just not seemingly as common a lifestyle. You know, there are members you know, that will specialize in it, but a lot of the big players out in the ocean that go after shelled prey like sea stars are absent in freshwater completely. Right. So we're missing some of the major groups that would be doing that. Those big time drilling snails aren't found in freshwater. Mm -hmm. There's only a couple of members that make it in from other groups. And so there doesn't seem to be as strong a trend there. It is noted that there has been some, you know, notion of defensive features in, in freshwater snails, like shell thickening and more ornamented stuff. But even with those features that are similar to marine adaptations, they're still usually weaker, you know, quote unquote, less robust than marine counterparts. And it was noted that one issue might just be that freshwater habitats typically are less saturated in calcium, calcium carbonate than marine habitats. Less material to build those shells. It may be way harder and more expensive to build a beefy defensive snail shell in the freshwater than it is in the ocean. So there's just can't be that same pattern mm -hmm. because the chemistry just doesn't really allow it. So this does seem to be mostly a marine phenomenon. All right. So that part of the name. Yes. Uh, seems to be accurate. Absolutely. <laughs> and it does seem like a Bunch of it happened in the Cretaceous, so it's still all right. It's still leaning. So it is still the mostly marine, mostly Mesozoic, mostly revolution. Yes, exactly. The MMMMMR. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've gone over the a general overview of the MRR, let's talk about how we study it and what are some of the challenges of studying it because this is a big event dealing with mostly invertebrates, mm -hmm. so it's not always easy to study those groups. <laughs> After the break, we will look into what are some of the challenges in studying it, and what are some of the th things we think about why it happened. As is normal with large-scale evolutionary events in Earth's history, the Mesozoic Marine Revolution is complicated. It is not something that just happened overnight in one instance. It's a long, protracted, global, widespread, affecting multiple groups. It is extremely complicated and layered. So there's quite a bit of debate on the exact limits, debate on exactly how to define it. I saw one quote in a paper that said the term means different things to different researchers. Mm -hmm. So it is not a singular definition that can just be summed up easily. 
Right. This comes up a lot with, we've talked about events, extinctions and other events in Earth history a whole bunch on the podcast. And a thing that tends to happen is that events are identified and named based on early, relatively limited evidence. Exactly. Because that's where you start. You the start, big, obvious stuff. Yeah, you start with not knowing a bunch. So you have your general pattern of shallow marine invertebrates over time, and you point and you go, an extinction happened here, or a climate shift happened here, and it's noticeable and it gets a name, and you go, that's what it is. And then as the years go by, we zoom in and we get a whole lot more data and a whole lot more nuance, and we go, okay, that quote, event is actually three different events that mm -hmm. happened at three different times in a bunch of different places, and it actually lasted for this long. Th this happens over and over again, where we go, that point's interesting, let's look closer, and then we look closer, and it's way more complicated than it seemed when we had our preliminary data. Well, it feels like when you learn about things like wars, as you get older and you realize, actually, the leading up to it is incredibly important right. to put everything into context but we don't usually get that info information the first time we learn about it. Right. But And really, all of that is stemming off of the last war. Yes. So these two really should be connected. So the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, it was set up in part by the Cambrian Explosion. Yes. And everything's connected <laughs> and we have to sort of draw the lines. And so you have all of that nuance and complexity just whenever you're dealing with events on Earth because nothing fits within a bubble. There are some challenges to studying this event as well, just because of the kind of data we need to find to study the things that are unique about it, particularly the predator-prey relationship aspects. Not all parts of predation and the prey they're hunting are equally preserved in the fossil record. We don't always know who's hunting who. We don't all, even if we can tell this was a predator, we might not know what its prey was. Mm -hmm. Even if we can tell this was a prey item with defenses, we don't know who was hunting it, and we may not always have both sides of that equation. Right. We were talking about cephalopods mm -hmm. before, and cephalopods, especially the squishy ones like octopuses, don't fossilize very well. Exactly. So there's definitely biases in different aspects of the different trends throughout the marine revolution. You know, different kind of predation, the different kinds of grazers or burrowers, not all of them are preserving at the same rate, so there's definitely tricky aspect to try to figure out and find the patterns during this event. How do we get enough data to actually find where those patterns are peaking and lulling and when they're happening, et cetera, et cetera. One note that I thought was incredibly important is some major groups of durophagus, durophagus predators do it in a way that won't leave evidence. Hmm. Sea stars pull open the shell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't crack it. They're not drilling. They don't They're drill not it. crushing. Mm. So they just leave an empty shell, which means this incredibly important group of shellfish eaters. Oh, yeah. Still today, yeah. Uh, sea stars are a major group of predators. Like that's the re There's a reason that like a, a clam and mussel fisheries are terrified of them because they will just destroy entire crops. Their predation behaviors and habits are are effectively just not reportable. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely aspects of, were their habits shifting during this time? We may not be able to really measure that. So there's bits of data that might be missing, which is why so many of the studies are kind of forced to focus on crushing and drilling, because that leaves direct evidence on the prey item. Mm -hmm. You now have broken prey or drilled shells, so you have some result that you can actually measure. But even these can be difficult. Not all of the drill holes are equally distinct. You know, some, like the moon snail, leaves really, really characteristic holes. Some of the murex snails, though, can leave one similar to that. And their holes can be confused with octopoid. Mm. So a lot of the octopoid holes can are kind of ragged, it described them as. They're not nearly as clean. So they can sometimes be confused with others. So figuring out who's doing the drilling can sometimes be tricky. There's definitely ones that are distinct, but it's not always clear and not all species are as uniform as their, you know, close relative. Crushing predation is also tricky because you're dealing with broken shells, but shells can get broken yeah, the, other the ways. Teeth, teeth are not the only thing that can crush stuff. Exactly. Teeth and beaks and things. There can also be rocks yes. and just sediment building up on top of a shell. Precisely. And they said that is the biggest challenge is, was this broken in life or 
after you were buried and moved around and the sediment tumbled you. Right. We talked about this problem in episode 84 with our friend Laura about paleopathology, and we were mostly talking about bones yes. in vertebrates. The difficulty of telling, was this bone broken before this animal died, as this animal died, or after this animal died? And we run into a very similar issue with shells of yes. invertebrates. That's why looking for repair is so important. Yes, so just like I, in bones, mm -hmm. you see signs of healing. That's really important. That means this definitely broke while you were alive, mm -hmm. and you were alive for a little bit longer afterward. At least for a bit. <laughs> yep. Enough for the cells to respond. We will see repair in shell. We talked about crinoids uh, showing repair. So that's one instance. I saw one report of a attempt to try to discern differences in breakage and you know, sediment tumbling mm -hmm. by putting some shells in a tumbler yeah, and seeing how do these breaks look differently and that those tend to form rounded edges. Sure. That makes sense. While a broken shell observed in uh, uh, nature nowadays has sharp edges. Yeah. I know also, and I think this came up in episode 84, that bone, living bone breaks differently than not living bone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just the fracture pattern will be different. And I wonder if there is something like that to shells. Yeah. Does this break? A shell isn't living the same way that bone is. No, it's because it, it's kind of a mineral deposit. Right. But is there some difference that you would see? Absolutely. And that's kind of what they were attempting here is if we look at a fossil deposit and we look at the ratio of sharp edge fractures mm -hmm. that could potentially be giving us an idea of the predation you know, rate or amount versus okay. just broken shells. Interesting. So that has been used. As mentioned, there are some predators that leave distinct markings, you know, crabs that break it in a very particular technique of chipping, like they called it peeling, Ugh. of peeling the shell away bit by bit to get to the prey. There's been stingray damage on heart urchins not noticed, and evidently spine insertion in bivalves by snails. So inserting a spine, a spine of the shell into the bivalve shells oh. to wrench them open, yeah, to pry it open, can hmm. leave a very distinct marking. So that you either have to determine how this broke differently, or find those characteristic breakings. Yeah. But a lot of the research is looking at the prey, not the predators, because even if we do find a predator with tools that would let it be durophagous, we don't know that's what it was using those for. Right. We've talked about this problem before of knowing what the diet of a fossil animal is. You can hypothesize all we want, but unless we find something inside of its guts that yes. we have very little way of knowing for sure. Which is another thing that comes up with studying the MMR. There are predators, even durophagous ones, that swallow the entire prey. Mm -hmm. Even if they're crushing it as they're, you know, getting it in their mouth, they're going to then swallow everything. So they're not going to be leaving the shells behind necessarily. Right. It makes me think of, I know I've mentioned this before as well. We have at least one turtle shell from the gray fossil site that has alligator tooth marks in mm -hmm. it. And it's a really cool direct example of this thing got bit, but also almost for sure this thing didn't get swallowed by that alligator yes because if it got swallowed then it, we wouldn't have found the shell and that is definitely one of the tricky parts with things predators that will be swallowing their prey whole is we may lose the evidence because it gets dissolved but we do have chances even in this case of if it's passed through in copper lights there may be shell fragments because mm -hmm. not all organisms can dissolve bony material that way and we have the option of finding regurgitolites you know if they threw up the hard pieces which lots of predators that eat hard shelled stuff will do yes eat the thing crush it in their mouth swallow it all digest the good parts throw up the hard parts and get rid of it lots of fish lots of birds mm -hmm. do stuff like this and there have been notes for each of these that have aided evidence to the mmr urchin spines and mollusks in fish gut contents from the jurassic there's been regurgitolites that seem like likely from fish also in the Jurassic, containing mollusk and echinoderm, other echinoderm parts, which is evidently the oldest evidence of predation on urchins. Oh, interesting. So these have been very key to bits and evidence of this kind of predation during the MMR. And coprolites come up. The one thing I found mentioned most commonly with coprolites is micro coprolites from crabs. Hmm. Uh, little, little tiny crab poops. Itty bitty ones. These were from the Triassic, so these were in that earlier part of the MMR. 
and showing evidence of some durophagy. And one thing they noted here is that these showed little or no evidence of acid damage, meaning these predators may not have evolved the ability to dissolve, to process. Right, they, they're getting the soft stuff. Yes. That was an interesting note to me as to if this is you know, early on in the mm-hmm. uptick of durophagy, that adaptation may not have been common yet. Yeah, you they, these animals weren't able to digest any of that hard material. Yes. Oh, cool. So these challenges have to be kept in mind while investigating the MMR and trying to find the patterns within it. This is also meant that figuring out the exact causes of this phenomena has been debated in the past. Uh, the likely triggering for it seems actually fairly agreed upon that it is a that it was a time where the energy resources for environments was increased Mm. that allowed more intensive more active more complex more varied lifestyles to be sustained in the environment and that generally most things i found seem to point to that throughout the time everything just supports the idea that energy budgets were on the rise throughout this revolution yeah that there's various parts of the ecosystem were getting better at doing what they were doing becoming more abundant becoming more diverse and leading into that feedback loop you were talking about before yes and that this was likely triggered by having access to more energy more nutrition and what this has been linked to is likely vul- volcanism down in the depths mm. early on probably triggered by the breakup of Pangaea. Yep. And this influxing a whole bunch of chemicals and nutrients into the water during the Triassic, and that this seems to sync up with a time of just increased interpreted metabolic rates. We can't get direct evidence on the metabolism of fossil creatures, but we can interpret it based on growth speeds and body sizes Mm -hmm. to get an idea of these organisms sure do seem like they're growing faster and bigger than they were. One very likely answer for how that happened is increased metabolism. Yeah. The breakup of continents also tends to create lots of new shallow ocean. Yes. There's uh, a area. There's a whole bunch of like side effects that they said all lean toward a more productive ocean. Mm-hmm. The nutrients released by the volcanism. Sure. Increased productivity from global warming that happened during the time. Hotter environments and hotter seas often can be more productive. Increased sea level, creating more shallow areas. And shallow ocean is where most of the life in the ocean hangs. Yeah, because you can get sunlight. You get sunlight. That's where you get your reef systems and your sea weeds and algaes and plants and stuff can, can thrive. And so it really just seems like this event was kicked off by things just becoming more and more productive. Interesting. More productive seas. Add it, Add this to the long list of things that the breakup of Pangaea did right. to the world. Right. <laughs> Go back to episode 141 about supercontinents. Absolutely. And, and it has been linked that this is very likely why we see predation increase. Because in a low metabolic environment, you can't have a lot of high energy, high pursuit predators, right? because that's just too energ- energetically costly to maintain. Mm-hmm. And you definitely can't have a lot of specialists that are living those high octane lifestyles in smaller environments. There's just not quite as much energy to go around. Right. There's not enough food mm-hmm. to sustain those kinds of lifestyles. So it's not that when we see these boosts in productivity and available energy and nutrients, it allows for not only more active predators, but also those more costly defenses to be evolved. Because you've got now this time where you've got more nutrients, more habitats for your producers to do well. Yes. Your algae, your plants and stuff like that, which then allows your herbivores to do well, which then allows everybody to do well. Exactly. So it's been thought that this might be why we see that tango of those two features increase during times like this. They've noted that a lot of the most successful deterrents and defenses to predation are often quite metabolically expensive. Yeah, those big shells, that's a lot of work. Exactly. Making thicker shells, making more ornamentation on it, uh, making toxins. We've talked about how metabolically expensive that is, and that's a very common defense for sea creatures. Even just running away. Yes, and that was their swimming or leaping away. (laughs) Yep. All of these things take more energy for your body to do. 
And if there's more energy to go around, that is now a more feasible defense and not one that is detrimental to your evolution. This also could potentially explain why we see predators diversify so aggressively during these times, because now that there's more life and more available food, there's also the higher likeliness that you can specialize in a prey item. Mm -hmm. And there's enough of that prey item to actually sustain your populations. Right. You know, if you if you specialized in one species beforehand, there might not have been enough for you to actually specialize and survive with big enough numbers to then diversify and, you know, proliferate into new species. Or there may be many species doing that thing yes. and you can specialize in eating those. And so this could allow more specialization. It also means that smaller, more isolated habitats have enough energy to have successful, specialized, more active predators. Both of these can lead to diversification by isolating mm -hmm. species into behavioral roles and habitats, which promotes speciation. So that could be why we see diversity boost up so much with predators during these times, because now they can become more diverse and actually be successful doing it. All of this is why the escalation hypothesis became so popular with the MMR. So once again, the escalation hypothesis, which I saw in one paper overviewing it called One Long Argument <laughs> as a view of how evolution can work. This is the enemy competition driven evolution, a model of evolution that says predators exerting selective forces on prey forces them to adapt, which then forces the predators to adapt. And that arms race that we talk about so commonly can shape whole communities just because of this antagonistic interaction between organisms. And this has come up with tons of events. The MMR, the Cambrian explosion, this is very commonly pointed at for when we see sudden increases in diversity of both predator and prey mm -hmm. that seem to be evolving new ways to feed and new ways to defend themselves, respectively. This also has been pointed at for the colonization of deeper habitats by sedentary, immobile prey items that can't run, so they have to go live somewhere else, mm -hmm. where hopefully the predators won't be bothering them, and makes sense in the face of that increased metabolism and mobility of speeding up the competition, because now you're actually chasing each other, you're actually avoiding each other. It's not as passive a hunting and defensive behavior as a lower energy environment might have. And this is supported by the fact that we often see the radiation for durophagous fish in the early Triassic sinks up with a lot of shell defenses during that time. And we see that the evolution of the drilling snails seems to sync up with all the increase in drilling holes. But there are those who have pointed out some of the inconsistencies and have debated the validity of this hypothesis a bit. So there is, there is a bit of debate. First off, not all of the evidence actually seems to sync up with the concept of escalation perfectly. There's things that are off time, and there's things that don't seem to fit that answer perfectly. The cryonoids, where the fact that we had shallow water populations after the Mesozoic, mm -hmm. does seem to indicate that they weren't all fleeing from predators, at least equally. Right. So there is either populations that did not respond that way or something else was causing that migration to deeper waters. So there's been instances like that where we do not see a uniform response to predation across a prey group, which either means that escalation isn't the only answer or there could potentially be a better answer for what was happening. It's also been noted that during some times of the Mesozoic, there is actually less evidence for competition. Because escalation is not just predator-prey, but also competition with your rivals. You know, your other members trying to exploit the same environment and resources. In faunal communities, so these are organisms uh, sitting down in the sediment. Mm. Uh, that's what in faunal typically refers to. In the early Jurassic, show a marked increase in the way they're utilizing ecospace, the different ecology roles and places in their environment. They actually noted that it plateaus during the rest of the Jurassic. It hits a peak and then maintains that. So we see a high usage of ecosystems by organisms, which highly suggests that they were efficiently utilizing the resources there with many organisms utilizing resources in the same environment. Yeah. 
which is a argument for niche niche partitioning. Right. Adapting to different parts of your ecology. Yeah. And so this actually would argue against the what's called competitive exclusion. That is one of the ideas in escalation that competition excluding some and forcing them into new roles therefore could mean that we had different dynamics going on during this time. So that link between the situation of these in faunal, these sediment sitting organisms like crinoids doesn't actually seem to sync up with predation as securely. Right, as the main driving force there. Yes. Which, like we've gotten at, makes a bunch of sense. Yeah. That there isn't one go-to explanation for every instance and every habitat. And indeed that a lot of these things kind of fit together. So like what you were just describing, uh, organisms diversifying into different niches within the ecosystem can also be a thing in response to competition. Yes. That you can have intense competition that results in organisms being pushed in, sort of secured into their own ecological niches. So these things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. So we we have evidence that can be interpreted multiple ways, Mm -hmm. depending on if we had all the information, what was actually happening. Another thing I saw noted was that some evidence of drilling predation is out of sync from when we see rises in the drill the drill holes and the predators. There is a notable rise in drilling predation in the Eocene, which is roughly a hundred years after we see the urchins and, and members of that group that moved deeper into deeper waters and the rise in mollusk drilling. So there seems to be kind of dis- disconnected events in certain parts of the these behaviors that we would assume should sync up right. every time. It's not as clear cut as the this happened and this response happened right away and then this happened and then this response. Yes, exactly. So they put at one point that the lag between these two suggests that predation may not have elicited that escalatory, that escalation response from the prey, mm-hmm. that we didn't have that push-pull that is suggested by escalation. And so it may not be a as consistent a phenomena, potentially. And so one of the things that a lot of these, you know, kind of responding papers are pointing out is that the MMR is what they often describe as asynchronous, that it's not always synced up the way that we would expect it to be based on those initial thoughts and perceptions. You know, not that it wasn't happening that way ever, but that it's not this perfect one-to-one and that some of them seem to have lagged where the one group seemed to respond to the other way after Mm -hmm. something happened. And that doesn't really seem to suggest a strong evolutionary pressure that immediately responded. It took a while for that change to seem to kick in. So there's definitely some evidence. Another one I found pointed out that there's actually very few studies that illustrate long-term patterns for the influence of predation, even in the Cambrian explosion. Hmm. That there's even debate there that uh, there's not a ton of at least quantitative data showing solid patterns that that was the driving force for that diversification as well. So it's just one of those that it fits a lot of the models, but there's definitely parts and pieces that actively seem to not fit yeah. within that arms race model. So there's more going on, which again, I, this is an event that took place over tens, hundreds of millions of years all over the planet. Of course, there's more going yes, on. Yes, there can't be one answer. There's right. There's never a single answer for a problem this big. <laughs> yes, it's like when we talk about extinction. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's never just the one thing. Yep. There's always other, there's always extenuating circumstances. You can't just blame the rock. You have right. to look at what else was you going on. See, yeah, a, a different day, a different time, that rock might not have been that big a deal. Exactly. <laughs> and other propositions have been put forth for either other potential driving factors that could replace escalation or in tandem with it. And one of the papers I found, which also had a great title, which is Love, Not War, Drove the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. That maybe it was updates in mating styles. And they point out that to be a active mater where you're actually seeking out mates and... As opposed to a lot of marine invertebrates that are kind of like just releasing gametes into the water... And then they meet up somewhere and you make a little larva or whatever. But animals that are actively seeking out mates, doing courtship rituals, yes, stuff like that. Yes, exactly. Broadcasters, which are typically pumping their gametes out into the water and are, are often just stationary or much slower. Mm-hmm. 
are extremely common in the ocean. And then what they called contact maters, which have to get either at least in close contact with each other, if not fully on copulation. Right, to exchange materials. Yes, or, you know, some of them will still release their gametes in the water, but we're going to do it right next to each other. Right. So that way, that way we're pretty sure yes. these are going to find each other. And so you still have <laughs> basically all the steps that you would think of in a typical, like, you know, mammalian mating style of you have to find the mate, you have to, you know, sometimes court the mate or fight rivals, and then you have to, you know, physically sync up to fertilize the the new eggs a lot of the adaptations that would make you good at that new mating style are very similar to adaptations that would make you a good predator hmm you need to now be able to cruise your environment you know, move around to find new mates you have to have advanced enough senses to pick out your mate from the crowd and if you have courtship ritual rituals or competition with rivals that is another level of activity and complexity to your behavior, all of which are very similar to hunting down prey. Yeah. So there could be a parallel between mating behavior and increasing diversity of predators because the skills overlap heavily. Yeah. Interesting. And because the skills overlap, if if it starts with one, it could easily then be taken over by the other. Yes. And they pointed out that fertilization strategies are very often highly conserved phylogenetically, meaning that this group tends to breed this way and that is pretty solid. So we can often interpret what their ancestors likely were doing because of how solid that connection is. So it's allowed them to find some patterns in these mating styles. The research found that broadcasters, diversity has remained relatively st steady over the last 450 million years. That it's it's kind of been pretty good. There was a downturn and recovery during the end Permian, but otherwise pretty solid. Contact maters were also stable during the Paleozoic and early Mesozoic, but then about 150 million years ago, they began diversifying at what they called a constant exponential rate. Mm. So incredibly diversify more diversity than than before. Nowadays, contact maters account for about 75% of marine genera which is approximately, they put about a three-fold increase over the last 150 million years. So there is a notable increase in this mating style mm -hmm. during the marine revolution, not just predation. Yeah. So there's definitely a trend here. And they said that since this kind of mating has likely existed since the Cambrian, this delayed diversification begs explanation. Yeah. You know, that this, is, this isn't that they've just been diversifying since. Something happened. And that this would also sync up with the increase in productivity yeah, that we talked about. I was about. just going to say, yeah. more energy, you yes. can be more active. It's all the same energy requirements. You're having to be more active. You're having to be more social. You're having to put more effort into reproduction, all of which takes more energy, all of which would be helped if there's more energy to go around. And very similar, it now means that smaller populations can be more successful in more isolated places because now there's enough energy there, mm -hmm. which promotes that diversification. And they noted that for broadcast spawners, we don't see this same pattern because many of them are stationary suspension feeders, picking food just out of the water. So they don't benefit the same way as a mobile, more active, high energy organism. So it's been suggested, at least by you know, this group of researchers, that potentially mating habit could be as big or even more important to interpreting the diversification events during the MMR than just predatory behaviors and defenses alone. And like with our previous example, this is another one of those, this isn't a mutually exclusive no. scenario. Yes. That if you are evolving to become more active, more interactive in the environment, for whatever reason, it makes you more able to be more active and interactive in the environment for other reasons. Yes. Well, and it's definitely one where one of these could have kicked off mm -hmm. your success and then the other kicked in and, you know, become more important or equally important. Like, right. This, the is fact a, this is another feedback. Loop yes, exactly. That you get better at being a good predator, which makes you better at finding mates, which can be selected for and make you an even better predator. And so I, I, for an event like that, we often talk about feedback loops. Yes. When we're talking about these big dramatic events, things that continue to build upon each other. Yeah, where the next step just opens the door to the next step. Yes. And so... 
most of the things you'll find when you just look up the Mesozoic Marine Revolution will focus on predation, but there are papers and researchers looking at the other aspects of these organisms to suggest having more energy in the ocean doesn't just let you hunt better. Yeah. It can let you do a lot of things better, and not all organisms fit perfectly into one model. Yeah. Some seem to have been doing different things, and some seem to have been responding in very different ways. So we need to parse out group by group and reason by reason and time period by time period. Yes. What was happening in the Triassic <laughs> seems to have been notably different than the Cretaceous. Yes. And habitat by habitat. Yes. It's, it's, it's complex. It's extremely complex. <laughs> and this is still a fairly, re you know, this is the 70s that this was really kicked in. So yeah. we've got a lot to look into. That's very interesting. Yes. That, that's a, this is a really cool. I, I really like when we get to dig in to these events in Earth history and sort of tease out the nuance and the open questions and the patterns that are emerging or that aren't the obvious thing that you first think of. Yeah, well, and that's the thing I very much like about it, because those obvious connections that first jump out probably aren't wrong, but we shouldn't stop there. Right. So, yeah. Very cool. Absolutely. This will be the end of our discussion for the MMR. Hope you all enjoyed if there is some aspect of this that we didn't cover, if there's something you want to know more about, you can contact us with all the links down in the description to let us know and ask for more topics based on this. If you want specifically the arms race, since we talk about it so regularly, that'd be a great topic. But for now, we will wrap up our discussion of the MMR and move toward the end of the episode with our last section, our patron question. We like to answer one of the questions given by one of our patrons every episode because if you sign up on patreon at certain levels you can submit a question that we will answer live here on the podcast and this episode our question is this episode's question is related to the subject of a major change to environments <laughs> this question comes from daria who asks if there was an apocalyptic event in which most humans don't survive and somebody were to release all the animals from the zoos which animals would cause the most chaos or survive, and how would it affect future populations of animals? Very fun question. Uh, this makes me think of that documentary, the, the Earth After People, where mm -hmm. it was like, what if everyone got raptured? How would all the infrastructures yes. you know, survive? And I know one of them talked a bit about zoos, and they had that question of, you know, it depends on which ones could get out. Here, if they were all just released simultaneously. Right. If we just snapped all the bars yep. away, all, all the... the plexiglass and the walls from the zoos disappeared and anything could just go wherever it wanted. I think that, you know, some of the main things that would decide that right away is a lot of zoo animals live in zoos in environments that they can't actually survive in because it's maintained at a temperature and humidity level that's good for them indoors. Right. So you, know. you would need things that uh, you would need to be in a part of the world with a Con with conditions that these animals could already survive yeah. in. So like a lot of your zoos in the northern halves of North America and, and you know, higher latitudes, the reptile houses there probably aren't going to contribute much. Right. Because most of those reptiles are much more tropical or at least lower latitude. Mm -hmm. So you know, that sort of stuff, you're not going to get a lot of that just because they can't handle the winters in those areas. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is a very sort of specific thing. Here in the southeast of North America, a lot of zoos are really good at maintaining populations of species from Southeast Asia. Yep, yep. Because we have very similar... It's why there's so many red pandas in zoos in specifically this part of the country. Yeah. Because it's surprisingly similar to Southeast Asia today. Yes. Which is where they natively live. So, like, red panda... Like, stuff from Southeast Asia might do okay here. Mm -hmm. Speaking of stuff from Asia and North America... Probably a whole lot of bugs. Oh, yes. I would, was going to say. Would do really well and potentially start wiping out a bunch of plants in oh, different yeah. parts of the world where those bugs aren't supposed to be. And so, yeah, I think you'd get a lot of surprising things like that where it's just like, evidently, giraffes do great in this part of this country. Who would have thunk it? Yeah. They they actually are extremely comfortable here and the plants work with them. So, well, it makes me think of another fun real world example that we've brought up on the podcast a bunch of times is the hippos in South America. Yes, exactly. That were captive and then released 
and decided that that's where they live now. And just kept being hippos. And now they're they're hippoing it up in a place that we wouldn't have expected. Yeah. So, yeah, I think a bunch of zoo things would survive. Another thing that's going to be important here is were there enough of them in the zoo exactly. to actually make a population, mm-hmm. which for large animals, almost across the board, the answer is going to be no. No, because but. a lot of those, you don't have enough room to have a large population in a zoo. Right. So you, you might have... only have two tigers. Yes, exactly. And to have a breeding population of animals, you need dozens to hundreds And with less social animals, like those reptile houses, a lot of times they they have the one cobra. Right. You know, cobra doesn't need friends because cobras are not, they're actually antisocial. If you put another snake in there, you You, will probably still only end up with one snake. (laughs) (laughs) So the ones that are going to do best are probably going to be things that either can produce lots and lots of babies. Yes. With a, starting from just a couple of individuals. (laughs) Or can be kept in large numbers. Mm-hmm. Once again, insects. Yes, uh, I think are probably going to be the best. Are probably going to be the best served by this scenario. Yep, yep. Also, and you know, we've talked about AZA standards when we've done talks on zoos before, and like mm-hmm. at Dragon Con, there are certain animals that you have to keep in larger populations because they're highly social. Yes, primates are one of those. Lots of birds fall into that category, and both of those are also extremely behaviorally adaptable like birds can fly where they need to go mm-hmm. and uh, primates are are smart enough to problem solve a lot of time so i feel like you'd probably get a lot of bird and primate populations popping up mm. because there's probably enough in the zoo that could be a mating population unless they you know controlled only having males or something or only having females sure sure to avoid mating but a lot of groups you know with primates have a mixed group because that's important for the dynamic yeah. So I think you could potentially get a lot of that popping up where they're not really super comfortable here, but they can make do because yeah, they can make do in cities. Out. Like they're <laughs> smart enough to problem solve our worlds. So, yeah. So I think the answer is less chaos than you'd expect. Yeah. Probably but, not a lot of lions and tigers just right. suddenly populating areas. Most of them aren't going to make it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you'd get some new populations showing up and probably wreaking havoc with uh, habitats here and there. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if you'd see a somewhat similar uh, pattern after an extinction that your big, big organisms and your really specialized ones probably aren't going to Mm -hmm. do as well because they need very specific requirements and population sizes. But your medium and smaller sized and more numerous and generalist groups are probably going to be able to find a place that they can slot themselves into the new ecosystem a little bit more easily. Yeah. So you might see a similar pattern there. Cool question. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Daria. Thank you to all of our patrons. If you are a patron and would like to submit a question for the patron question, uh, the uh, the Patreon, you'll find the link and send it to us. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you again for our requesters for this episode, for getting us to discuss this extremely complex but super interesting topic i had a lot of fun learning about all the various drill holes that there are to be (laughs) fascinated by thank you to our new patrons for your support and thank you again to jesse lucy and theodore to our for our new koozies our croc and snake koozies and uh, remember next month is spooky check in on saturdays for episodes about dragons dragons all month and then join us in on uh, November 11th for the spooky live stream open to everybody. Anyone is welcome to join. It'll be on YouTube. And I, I think that's, I think we're good. That's it. Go to the website for more details on all the stuff. Uh, and there will be a blog post. Yes. As there always is after this episode with more links and stuff. So we'll see you in a fortnight next month with Allie. That's true. Next episode, Allie episode, talk about plants. And then just there'll be dragons all the way through, <laughs> all the way down. I'm, I am so excited. It's going to be good. Oh, I'm. I, mm. <gasps> Goodbye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.